All right, Jennifer, thank you for joining us today. I am um, I'm really excited to talk to you because you're you're no stranger to the work that, that we do. You know, this idea of helping CEOs create high performing cultures and specifically around the idea of transformation, um, which is a overused word nowadays. Everything is transformational. Um, but we think that our work is transformational and we've been doing it, Brad's been doing it for close to 30 years now. And you've known Brad for many of those years and you've had many transformations in your in your life, you know, uh, to your newest job as CEO. So I'd love to just hear, you know, your thoughts on that word transformation and just talk about maybe your own leadership journey. That is a big word and thanks for having me, uh, Tom. Um, you know, I, I think at the, the core of when I think of transformation, there's hope there that um, there is a possibility of a different future or opportunities to grow and evolve. Um, uh, and yet we're still ourselves. It doesn't mean that, that we lose who we are at our foundation, but we can grow and evolve. Um, in, in terms of leadership, as I reflect back, um, I, I think I started working with Brad uh, a little over 10 years ago, and uh, uh, it's sometimes hard to remember uh, the differences, but as I reflect back, uh, you know, I was newer to leadership at that point in, in my career, and I don't think I had made that connection that um, when you're a leader, your job really becomes accomplishing the, the mission and, and getting work done through others. Um, and that the job is really supporting them um, to be their best selves and operating at the best level and getting barriers and obstacles out of their way. Um, and so really starting to see that as a goal for myself helped me change because before I was still thinking like um, somebody who was doing the work and than expecting people to do it exactly the way I did. Um, and the good news is there's not just one right way to do something. And that was something that I think was really helpful early on to, I had a tendency to have very right, wrong thinking. Um, and so to realize, you know, there's more than one effective way to get something done. And if I'm willing to open myself up to other points of view, um, we're gonna accomplish so much more. Um, and, you know, when I think about transformation in that context, you know, I'm in the business of behavioral health. So literally we're in the business of helping people transform their lives and being their healthiest, best selves. And so if we as an organization can't transform and grow, um, how can we possibly lead and inspire others to do the same? And, and so for me, that is the work. Um, and it's, not only creating an environment that encourages the people who I work with um, to be open to how we can transform and grow so that the people we serve can. It's also being willing to do the work myself, which is not always easy um, and um, has taken me a lot, of a lot of journeys in my lifetime. <laughs> I love it. She's, she's willing to throw herself out there and talk about her own journey maybe um maybe give us some examples john of how this has played out in your own life well you know one of which and i have to say um this may uh, one of the things when i think back to that first program that that um we had done with phoenix um we kept talking about wanting people to be healthy and um some of the best coaching we got as a team was you know you all are talking about health but we've sat here in the last few days and watched you eat a lot of really unhealthy food and make a lot of, you know, really. So how can you be leaders when you're not really taking care of your own health? Um, that really stuck with me as something, boy, how can we have integrity in this work of encouraging people to be healthy and make healthy choices when we aren't role modeling that, when we aren't emulating that. And so um, for me, that really stuck with me and realized um, at the time, I had suffered a pretty significant loss. I had lost my uh, fiance in an accident a few weeks be uh, before our wedding. Um, and um, I coped by eating and I had gained a, a great deal of weight and I knew I wasn't making healthy choices. And so for me, it began a journey of how do I 
really address that. And um, it really isn't easy, but it's been um, an evolution. And I will say um, uh, ended up to the point where I lost over a hundred pounds um, in the process. Um, and it was really not a, only about making choices like eating healthy or exercising, but it was also re really even more important about my commitment to my health and being able to um, every day say, am I gonna choose health over comfort in this moment? Um, because it's, it's a struggle, it's so easy. I know that's like my coping mechanism, like sugar is my drug of choice. And so, um, you know, nothing like a good pandemic to test that for me. Um, and it hasn't always been easy, but it's something I'm very mindful of. And, and this work has helped me. And I have to say that being willing to, to share that and you know it's you can't hide when when you're struggling with weight and so it's not something you can hide it was very noticeable to my team and being willing to be vulnerable and talk about those struggles and that that commitment to health i think opened up an environment where we were all willing to be more open about the things we're struggling with and how we can support each other which ultimately ultimately made us a stronger team Wow, there's so much there, Jennifer, that you just put out on the table for all of us. That's um, really awe-inspiring. You know, the fact that you've lost over 100 pounds. I think most people's people are still picking their job off the floor to think about the commitment and the the energy and the real focus on the future and, and a sense of of hope. And especially given that horrendous you know experience you had with your your fiance, um, I'm curious. What allows you to put that out there for the world? What allows you to, to share that with the world in such a, uh, a way? Uh, I, I think one of the things that, that has helped me transform is, you know, one of the things that I learned in my work um, with Phoenix was that I do have um, a, a default success strategy of perfectionism. And so, um, I like things to be perfect. And I, I think for me, you know, when I mentioned that, that um, it was the thing I couldn't hide, it was the thing that wasn't perfect. Um, it was really transformative for me to say, it's okay not to be perfect. In fact, we're all human. Isn't that why I got in the field of helping people is that I realized that people have opportunities to grow and I want to help them be healthier. Um, and so it's powerful to say, yeah, me too. I'm struggling with that too. Um, and I don't have to have it all figured out or be perfect in order to be effective. Um, and I think that's the case as a, a, a leader as well, that um, it's okay to say, I don't have all the answers, but I know that together we'll get through this. Um, we're all facing challenges right now. Um, I think about this pandemic, budgetary challenges, you know, trying to figure out how to navigate a, a whole new way of doing business. And we can't do it on our own and we have to be willing to say, I don't have all the answers, but together let's figure it out. Um, and, and so I've just found for me that hiding that and keeping that to myself wasn't bringing me joy and really wasn't helping me have integrity with wanting to help others. So um, if it helps somebody else to share the story, um, then I'm all for it. Hmm. There's a clear commitment to others, to helping others. And if you can lead by example, then that is a very attractive force in the world, I think. And too many leaders hide behind something, you know, hide hide their, their willingness to share openly um, because they think it makes them look weak. And what I think I hear from you is quite the opposite, that the more I can just be real with my team, doesn't mean I have to share everything, every every private detail, but if I can just be real with my team, it actually makes us a, a much stronger team because we're able to help each other and, and support each other. Um, how do you how do you think about, I mean, those are some huge transformations, obviously, and, and your career has taken you through lots of different jobs and lots of different states, and now you've got, um, you know, you're a CEO with hundreds of employees. Um, and, um, so how have how do you, it's hard, It's easy to understand sort of transformations in a longer scale like that, but if we zoom into like a week or maybe even a day, how do you think about transformation at that level? I think 
I can speak to the process for me. Um, I, I think it's reminding myself daily, you know, what is, what am I most committed to and having that, you know, focus on um, uh, a goal and why it's important. So, um, you know, I, I know this is kind of a trendy or maybe cliche, but finding your why and, and keeping that fresh in your mind. Um, because it's so easy in the day to day to get caught up in kind of a crisis orientation and just going through the motions. And so for me, literally, it means starting every day with um, grounding myself. And I've got a, a process where I do a little bit of reading, I do a little bit of reflecting, I do a little bit of, of journaling. Um, and it's been immensely helpful. Um, and that's one constant that no matter how busy I get, no matter how chaotic life gets, that's one thing I start every day with just some quiet time. Uh, and for me, it's also spiritual. So quiet time um, with God, prayer, meditation, and a little bit of journaling and reflection. Um, and and it just grounds me and keeps me focused um, for that day. Ground, ground you in what? You know, a ground you is sort of a metaphor. I'm curious, mm -hmm. what does it ground you in? I think it's a, a reminder of what I have identified as my purpose. Like, you know, what what of what do I want to accomplish? What do I want my legacy to be? How do I want to make a difference um, in this world? And um, because you know, there's it's not always comfortable, right? And and so. Uh, it's a lot more comfortable to, and I, I'll go back to the food analogy with, with losing weight. It's a lot more comfortable and enjoyable to, you know, eat a whole bunch of chocolate chip cookies, but it's not helping me uh, 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 be healthy in the long run. And so, you know, and why, why do I value health? Well, I, the healthier I am, the more I am able to help others, the more, the better I feel, the more energy I have. I mean, there's just, and, and thinking through that, and saying, you know, that cookie doesn't sound so good after all. Um, yeah, it provides a, a grounding into a much bigger context. You know, mm -hmm. it's not the comfort of the moment, but what am I committed to yeah. over the next several years of my life? That, that I think mm -hmm. I hear you saying that that helps you to get grounded in your spiritual faith. And mm -hmm. so what would you, you know, tell another leader or maybe a, an up and coming leader that says, well, I don't have time for that. You know, I got too much stuff to do. I think that not finding time for that um, has huge consequences. <laughs> it's going to force. So, you know, I talk about, but honestly, it's probably 10, 15 minutes. And I think the reality is if we're all honest with ourselves, um, we have 10 or 15 minutes that we're probably um, not as focused or not as intentional or, or, you know, whether, it, and so I think we all can carve out 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and, and it's, you make time for what's important. Um, I, you know, I, I reflect back on my life and some of my most productive years were times when I had the most on my plate. Um, I, I don't always think it's about time. It's about the choices and how we prioritize our time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it uh, more directly. It's never about time. <laughs> it's it's one of the one of the great excuses we hear you know in our work across the country is time 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 i wish i had more time but it's never about time we all have the same <clears throat> amount of time every day it's it's as you said it's how we choose to use it and in your case you're saying that if i don't spend time grounding myself then i'm not as effective for the other you know 10 12 hours that i'm i'm doing what i need to do i'm working or i'm Inter interacting with family or friends that that grounding actually makes me much more effective in everything else that I do. Um, you know, the, the sort of day to day. Um, and again, I hate to use the words transformation, but, but I really do believe this, that in the moment we can, we can choose different things, right? We can choose different decisions. Um, so when you're running up against a, sort of an emotional reaction to something. Um, how do you find the, the source? How do you ground yourself in that half a second to then transform and maybe respond in a different way as opposed to reacting emotionally? You can stop, ground yourself in what matters to you, ground yourself in your purpose, and then respond more thoughtfully. How do you, how do, you do that on a day-to-day -day basis? 
Yeah, I think it's something that um, over time I've gotten better at. Uh, before I got into leadership, being in the behavioral health field, I am a trained therapist. And so you do have to learn how not to react to some of the things that clients say to you. It's because, and I think for me, the, the phrase that like self-talk I do in my head is when I have that kind of reaction, the first thing that comes to mind is this isn't about you. Don't make this about you because oftentimes we're personalizing things that really aren't about us. So, um, you know, let's say a staff member of mine says something and at the moment I have a reaction because I may be experiencing it as something off mission or so I wouldn't have done it that way. And, and it's, who do I need to be in that moment? And so certainly for me, it's, I wanna make sure I bring it back to the mission. Uh, but most of the time what I have experienced is people are anxious and they're afraid. And so, you know, how do I create a, a psychological safety in that moment and not let my reaction um, get in the way of that. And I'm not saying that means that I'm like a robot or I don't, I can't have a reaction, but I think it's who we're being and how we react. So, you know, being able to calmly say, you know, I gotta be honest with you, I'm having a reaction and I'm, I'm processing that because honestly, I don't hide that well. And so it's better for me to just say, I'm having a reaction and I'm trying to figure that out and be, be honest about it. And, you know, this is what I'm hearing you say, is that what you intended? And, you know, nine times out of 10, they'll be like, oh no, that's not what I intended to say at all. It's a communication breakdown between the two of us. Um, and okay, well, what is it you really want me to hear? Sometimes it is, and we're just on different pages. And then it's, how do we have that conversation? Um, and how do I be willing to hear where they're coming from or what their point of view is and be open because uh, sometimes people will surprise me to want to go a direction that my knee jerk reaction is, yeah, I would never do it that way. Um, but actually, if I'm willing to be open and that could be a good idea. Other times I just really can't get on board. And I, I then have had to say as a leader, um, you know, find a way to say no in a, in a way that um, is as respectful as it can be and still validates them as, a, as a, an individual. Because um, I don't think um, helping somebody feel safe or supported means always just letting them have what, do whatever they wanna do or always saying yes. Um, in fact, that would be a really bad idea as a leader. Um, but I think it's finding a way um, to say yes or no in a way that is supportive um, and helps keep the mission in mind and that what's our core goal. Because I found that if I say no in a way that people understand how it doesn't fit with the mission, then they're more likely to say, oh, I get, I get the reason why. They may not agree with it, but they feel respected and heard and listened to. Mm. Yeah, and that's half the battle, right? Is being able to respect them and just be heard, especially in today's day and age, I think it's such a gift for people to be heard. You know, we're all moving so quickly um, that just spending that few extra seconds to just really listen to somebody, really make sure that you're getting what they're saying is such a gift. You don't have to, you don't have to agree with them. You know, this is the, this is the great challenge, I think, of creating inclusion, you know, creating inclusive cultures where we don't have to agree, but let's just, let's just listen to each other. Let's make sure that we understand our different perspectives and, um, cause if we can't even do that, if we can't even hear each other, we have no chance of, of making any progress together. Um, so you mentioned a couple of really pragmatic ideas, which I love, and I've seen you do the, a few of them, by the way, you know, I've, I've seen you say, I'm having a reaction to that. You know, I need to think about this for a second, or what did you mean by that? You know, opening an open and asking an open-ended question to kind of pull out of them more information. And as you said, nine times out of 10, that that usually is, oh, it's different than what I meant. That's not what I intended. Um, what else, what other tips would you you know share with the world here on how do you catch yourself in that moment from reacting emotionally and shifting and transforming over to responding you know, thoughtfully? I, this is gonna tie into what we were talking about earlier. I, I do think that the more we are taking care of ourselves and in a good mental space, we're more ready to 
handle situations like that. So I think it's important not to overlook that. You know, are you getting enough sleep? This is, sounds very basic, but I have to say, being in the helping profession, oftentimes those of us in helping professions are terrible at it. And I think leaders, we can be as well. So are we, you know, are we getting enough sleep? Are we eating healthy? Are we taking care of our own health? Um, because, and are we present in the moment too? Because in this world with, you know, the phone going off and I, multiple video screens and everything else that, that's going on, um, being fully present with that person, I think that is critical to making sure we're hearing uh, and, and, and being able to, because um, we may hear something and lose the context if we're not fully present as well. Um, um, so I think all of those things are important in terms of setting the right stage um, for that. I, I think it's also okay um, that if your reaction is so intense in the moment and you're aware of it to say, you know, I'm going to need some time to reflect on this. You know, can, can we revisit this tomorrow? Um, you know, we don't always have the luxury of doing that, but I think it it's okay to do that sometimes. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't happen to me often. I think because I've got that therapist training that I've learned to put put some of my emotions aside in the moment. But sometimes I just need, I, I've, I'm aware, like, you know, I'm having a real negative reaction to this person. Something's going on. I'm not even sure this is about them. I, I may need to go get some coaching in the next 24 hours, talk with somebody I, you know, trust before I revisit this conversation because, you um, and, I, and that doesn't happen often, but when it does, um, I, it, it's learning, you know what, I'm not in the frame of mind to be able to have this conversation right now. And I think it's important that if we're not in the frame of mind and we're having a strong reaction, and if we can't um, refocus ourselves, that we give ourselves a little time to process or calm down before we have the conversation and not do damage in that relationship. Yeah, when it becomes so intense or such a provoke such a reaction it's okay to just call attention to it and say oh, i need some time to think about this can we take a bread and i'll do this we'll we'll say let's let's come back to this in a half hour mm-hmm. <laughs> we both need to just walk away for a minute um and 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 my, my my wife as well you know with lots of relationships it's a it's a healthy way of just sort of taking it out and, and coming back to it um my wife and i will often do the uh, tag team thing with our kids, you know, okay, I'm out your turn. (laughs) I need a, I need a break. (laughs) So, um, you know, you're, you're, um, incredibly resilient person, in my opinion, uh, from what I, I've known of you over the years and you've maintained these transformations, you know, you've maintained this ability to, to focus on others, to bring about purpose, to transform, you know, in different jobs over the years and take on whole new different ways of thinking um, from my way to how do I empower others and get work done through others. You're now um, years into this new CEO gig, you're years into this weight loss journey. So how do you maintain that? How do you, what advice do you have for us on, you know, you make the transformation, but then how do you create a habit in your life or how do you create a, the stability going forward to keep it in your life? I, I think um, it's really being mindful about what helps you stay um, successful or what that maintenance plan is. Because I do, that's a very good point that when, you know, when I think about it from a treatment planning perspective as a clinician, it's, it's when you reach a goal, then how do you maintain that goal or how, how do you continue that new level of health? And so um, I, I do think it's being mindful about what, what do I need to be successful or maintain? What does that look like? And I think it's different for all of us. And some of it's a little trial and error, but it's also having accountability. And so, you know, when you think of something like weight loss, it's um, part of it is getting on the scale and checking out and seeing where you're at. It's a good barometer. Um, you know, I think as, as a leader, for me, one of the things that I really value is doing temperature checks. So going and talking with teams about how are things going? Are there any barriers you're experiencing? What can I do to, to support you um, in your work? Um, and even things like engagement surveys can give great results um, on, um, 
you know, how are people feeling? Are they feeling engaged? You know, what, where are the areas that, that they, I think it's, it's courageous for people to speak up. We, and I, it's on my mind because we're getting ready to do one at my organization every year. And part of it for me is going out and saying, we really do want to hear from you. And it's not only hearing it, but then also following through and sharing it's the conversations you have afterwards as well. Um, and so being, making that, it's like these things just don't, uh, miraculously keep happening. And so it's being intentional, being mindful, making it a priority. Um, you know, there's the, the adage, you know, what you measure gets attention. And I think what you prioritize um, helps you maintain that progress or that transformation. Yeah, making, making all that conscious. How do I, how do I consciously stay on the rails here? How do I consciously continue to foment this? It, it, it's the, the word remind, you know, you think about that word and it's literally remind to put back into our mind. And in a way we've got to do that almost every day as a leader, you know, why am I here? What am I doing? You know, what's this for? Otherwise it's easy to kind of slip back into old be- patterns and behaviors. Um, uh, so Anything else on the sort of the topic of, of transformation? Because the time is flying by and I want to ask you one more question before we wrap up here. No, I can't think of anything else. Okay. So um, book recommendations. I always love to ask our, our CEOs out there, you know, what's top of mind for them? What books would they recommend? So what would you, what would you share with us? I have two that I would recommend. Um, one at, uh, I don't know that people would think of as a, a leadership book, but um, for me, it's been very, me- very meaningful. And it's a uh, team of Ri- rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, it's about uh, Abraham Lincoln. And um, one of the things, and I was born and lived in Illinois a lot of my life. So Abraham Lincoln is something that, you know, the land of Lincoln. Uh, but one of the things that really amazed me about him as a leader was, you know, he came from very humble um, beginnings. He didn't have the privilege of other candidates and yet he won this election during a very difficult time. And you know, when you look at historians and how they've studied it, it's he had the ability to really put himself in, the sh- in other shoes. He didn't make it about himself and he was very vision um, focused as a leader. But you know, this particular book, what I love um, about it is he took the people who were his, comp- his opponents and built a cabinet. He didn't choose people who always agreed with him. He wasn't afraid to have people around him that had different points of view, but he chose people who shared his passion for the nation. And so he built a team of people with a shared vision that cared, but didn't all agree. And I think that's really healthy. Um, and at the core of it, he turned people who were opponents into people who worked together for a common purpose. But at the core of that was respect for each other. And so there was a tone of respect um, that really comes through in in that book. And I found it really inspirational. Um, Well, it's a good example of resilience too, because mm -hmm. if you, you obviously you have read, read about his history, he lost time and time and time again, and not just in politics, but in business too, Mm -hmm. you know, having taken out debts, he couldn't pay back and, losing businesses and then eventually paying those back because of his integrity. He, you know, he ended up paying them back and then losing election after election. You know, it's a, an amazing story of, you know, most of us probably would have given up after failure number four, but he just kept going. Yeah. And he struggled with depression and and didn't really hide that from others. And I, I think, you know, working in the field of mental health that when you struggle, it doesn't mean that you can't accomplish great things. It doesn't mean that you have to have it all figured out or you have to be perfect before you can accomplish great things. And so I often, uh, in, in, when I was doing group therapy, would use his story as an example. Um, and I just continue to be because, because of that resilience that you mentioned. So that, that would be one I would recommend. And the other one, uh, it's just a really practical book. Um, it's uh, The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni, and it talks about organizational health. And you know, one of the things I appreciate about Lencioni's style of writing is there's a story element, so it's very engageable, and there's some practical um, suggestions. But overall, it's really about building a cohesive team. 
but cohesive, and this is where this book for me ties in with the previous book about Lincoln, cohesive doesn't mean you just all say the same thing or you think the same way. It's a shared commitment to a greater purpose, but um, healthy conflict is, I mean, conflict is seen as healthy, respectful conflict, that you don't actually want a team of people who are just going to agree with you on everything. You want people who are bright and brilliant and have the courage to have a different point of view because ultimately that makes us healthier. If, if we're not, if we're gonna shut out, this is where it comes into inclusion, if we're gonna shut out other points of view, we're not gonna, we're gonna miss a huge opportunity to um, learn other opinions, diverse opinions, and be able to be more inclusive as an organization. So um, at the center of what he writes about, in addition to you know, cohesive team, it's really, there's that need to have trust um, and also there's the importance of communication and how it needs to cascade. And there's some practical advice on how to have effective meetings because, you know, we've all probably all been in some very ineffective meetings <laughs> and it's how do we use our time wisely um, and get things done and support each other in that work. So I, I found it to be a very helpful book and I've used it. Um, there's a corresponding kind of workbook that you can go through with your team. And I've used that with my teams before and, it's really um, stimulated great conversation and helped us um, as a team come together. I love it. I love it. It's um, yeah, his work. He uses the power of stories in a in a way mm -hmm. that's um, pretty brilliant, simple, you know, but but brilliant. And I think your point about cohesion is so important because we think that we need to, you know, everybody needs to sort of agree with each other. We need to create, um, you know. A, a sense of team where we all agree, and that's that's quite the opposite of what is effective. Um, how do you do that in a way that's productive and um, and honors each other, so we can we can help each other? So say both book titles again, just for everyone that's uh, listening and maybe didn't write it down. Sure, Team of Rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin, and The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni. Awesome, awesome. Well, Jennifer, thank you for the time. It's been a, it's been a blast as always. And um, I appreciate you spending the time with us today on the podcast. So have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful Thanksgiving that's coming up here. Thank you. Thanks for having me and happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you. Thank you.